Hi, I'm Bryce Crittenden. Hi, I'm Caroline Land, and welcome back to EPL's Overdue Finds. Caroline, we're here in studio. We are recording, uh, we've just recorded our 40th episode. Yes, and, your 40th episode. Well, I guess, well, overall the in podcast general, Overdue 40th Finds, episode. 40th episode. Yes. And uh, today we have a very special guest uh, that you're going to be hearing from in just a moment. Joining us is retired FBI criminal profiler and mine hunter author John Douglas, who's actually mm-hmm. going to be EPL's bringing him in here to Edmonton on October 28th as part of our Forward Thinking Speaker Series. It's really, really exciting. And helping us out to, with the phone interview today are our friends at M Tech Digital, who are letting us use their amazing studio to record today's episode. And we were very grateful for their assistance yeah. in getting the call through. We've both been really looking forward to this episode. And for those who maybe aren't that familiar with John Douglas, the Netflix show Mindhunter is based on his book of the same name. In fact, the character of Holden Ford on that show is based on John Douglas. Yeah, very loosely based, as we as, as we, we find learned. out in, in in the episode. Um, of course, John Douglas, uh, he was an innovator with the FBI in the late '70s by developing new investigative techniques for hunting serial killers and other violent offenders, and uh, really advancing the use in investigations of the procedure known as criminal profiling. Which, of course, everybody knows from watching really at pretty much any crime mm-hmm. TV show or or movie today. And since his retirement in 1995, he's remained active as an author, speaker, and independent investigator. Mm -hmm. The list of cases that he's been involved with, the people that he's interviewed, is just astonishing. He's consulted on high-profile cases such as John JonBenet Ramsey and Amanda Knox, and even worked with the defense team whose efforts led to the release of the West Memphis Three. Yeah, and along with writer um, Mark Olshaker, he's co-authored more than seven books, in addition to Mindhunter, including The Anatomy of Motive and his most recent release, which we talk about in this interview, called The Killer Across the Table. Mm -hmm. So tickets for his event are are currently on sale on Eventbrite, but we have a special treat for our Overdue Finds listeners. Yeah, Caroline, when people hear this episode, there's actually a good chance that general admission tickets for his event are sold out. It could, yes. I I have a feeling this one's going to go by really quickly. So um, if you are a true crime uh, buff, which I know we've talked about true crime a lot on this show, uh, you're obviously going to want to go check out his presentation. And I think you're really going to love today's interview because, you know, as we mentioned, John Douglas is a pioneer in in this field. And uh, pretty much he's talked to the who's who really Mm -hmm. of uh, serial, serial killers. So if you want to win a pair of tickets to his event, which I know is going to be sold out, uh, stay tuned after our interview and you can learn how you can win that pair of tickets. So without further ado, we present to you our interview with Mr. John Douglas. So thank you so much for uh, talking with us today. Uh, We're really looking forward to uh, you joining us here in Edmonton on Monday, October the 28th. And uh, I know you've, uh, I know you go around and you do quite a few of these presentations, but uh, what's your favorite part about doing some of these speaking events? What just amazes me is the, uh, the interest. Uh, It's uh, phenomenal. Uh, Anytime I go out and speak, um, I retired from the FBI 95. So Besides writing all the books, I'm also part of the speakers, a speakers bureau, and it's just um, I don't like to do a lot of media, you know, unless the pub- publisher <laughs> forces me, you know, me too. I, I just don't like to go on television. There's some case going on just to, you know, to shoot my mouth off. But where usually, when you see that the, the people are on these shows are not helping the investigation, and uh, so it's just when I do go out and do public speaking, and they know I'm coming, um, it, it's it's just uh, remarkable how many people will uh, will show up and the interest you know in this uh, in, in true crime uh, when Silence of the Lambs came out in 1991 and I assisted in in uh, the uh, John, the late Jonathan Demi the director and helped the actors 
uh, they they were telling me in the bureau, boy, it's too bad you're not out because you know this is like just a passing fad. This will, <laughs> will go away. Well, no, no way. Uh, when I got out of the bureau in 1995, then that's when Mindhunter came out, became a New York Times number one bestseller, and a year later in '96 became a New York Times number one bestseller in paperback. And I just heard uh, yesterday, and I just posted it on my own Facebook uh, page that uh, after 24 years. Mine Hunter is back on the New York Times bestseller list wow. after 24 years uh, in uh, in a true uh, uh, nonfiction uh, category. I, that's amazing. I don't know too many books have done anything like that, uh, you know, uh, you know, at all. And, uh, and then in London, they just they just came up with like the the, the all time top 15, uh, you know, books and uh, true crime books and. And we made that list along with uh, In Cold Blood with Truman Capote. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's really, it's, it's quite quite amazing. Well, congratulations yeah. on those honors. What can we expect to learn from your presentation with us, The Mind Hunter's Journey? I'm going to take the audience really just through the, the process, how really, how I got started. Um, like, uh, so I'll follow the book. It'll be somewhat very similar to what uh, the Netflix uh, TV series how the character Holden Ford who portrays you know portrays me uh, loosely portrays <laughs> portrays me I'll say that, that uh, uh, kind of following how that that all got uh, got started um, a lot of it is is 100 percent true uh, but then it's always the Hollywood the backstory that may change things a little bit from from reality but I'll I'll, uh, I'll tell the audience of how you know, where I came from, how I got started uh, working in uh, the F- FBI field offices of Milwaukee and Detroit, and then the kind of cases that I worked and and what really uh, got me started and interest, interested in doing this kind of research. Uh, and when I came back to the FBI Academy at age 32, I was the youngest, not only just the youngest instructor at the FBI Academy, and there was 110 instructors. and. And various uh, disciples, but the uh, that would be FBI headquarters total, uh, which has a thousand a thousand agents, and I was one of the youngest, if not the youngest, you know, agent who at 32. I still had seven years of FBI field experience in Detroit, Milwaukee, as I said. Plus, I also had four years of, of military service. I had uh, I was a bank robbery coordinator. I was a member of the SWAT team. Uh, and then I went over, I preferred being a negotiator, became a hostage negotiator. So I had all this this, um, this background when I was selected to come back to Quantico. But then when I got into the into the unit, I'll tell the, the audience, and it's really, it's following kind of the script of, of the series, is that uh, the agents were telling war stories of cases, having not ever interviewed the principals, the people involved in those cases, like a Manson or an Edmund, you know, Edmund Kemper, and auditing their classes, I not only observed that, but also observed that that these oftentimes the students in the class would challenge uh, challenge the instructors that their, their their facts were uh, were wrong, and um, that just kind of scared the hell out of me, thinking, oh my goodness, I'm a young guy, I have a good, strong, solid background. But I have to, I, I have to accelerate my learning, and that's when it all started. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell the audience up in Edmonton how, how I started, decided with my my partner to go out on the road, and and when we're doing these police schools, let's go into these prisons at nighttime uh, or on weekends, and let's see what Manson has to say, and Ed Kemper and David Burke, which is son of Sam, and Sirhan, Sirhan. And uh, Richard Speck and Ted Bundy. I mean, kind of like the who's who mm-hmm. in crime. And let's see what they have to say. And, and then, uh, and then, while uh, my partner and I we were investigators, it really, what really changed us is when we we met the Wendy character in the Netflix series, who's really Dr. Ann Burgess, who's a forensic nurse, and uh, she was doing research on victims of violent crime and studies of. Uh, uh, in studies of uh, rape, and she just completed a heart attack study predicting what males would, in all probability, have heart attacks after, uh, and looking at like 20,000 males. And so I met her, and we talked, and and what 
we were doing is it's kind of like what she was doing. We're doing like reverse engineering. We're, we're starting with like, like a crime scene, though, and and seeing our illness is going to be the that crime and the person who perpetrated that crime. Uh, so she suggested that we do the interviews, but unlike the show, it's not like uh, where she's telling us how to do the interviews. Uh, no, uh, that that was uh, our skill. We had, we had that. We learned. We made mistakes along the way, way, but we didn't ask her really to help us in that area mm-hmm. where we help, uh, asked her to help us is, is really on the academic side to, to publish in professional journals, mm-hmm. to publish um, the crime classification manual, which uh, we did, uh, a book, Sexual Homicide Patterns and Motives, that, that type of type of thing. And, and so then the unit uh, became a program, and then before you knew it, uh, within the FBI, it became a, a not only just a program, it became a unit, and, and in came the cases from all over, really all over the world. They started rolling in, uh, and uh, very very stressful work. I'll tell you, mm-hmm. I'll tell the audience that too. <laughs> it's not. You know, it's so many kids are interested in doing this kind of work in U.S. and Canada, England, all over. I get these letters. But there's very few people and, and very few police agencies that will do this kind of kind of work. And then, really, do they really understand what they're getting into when when you're working violent crime uh, daily and you're dealing with victims of these violent crimes, surviving victims and and families, and how that can spill over into your own personal life, which it did, which it did with me and, and many of the people. My friends and colleagues who worked in this area. So, are you really sure? You know, it's not like what you see on television when you're watching Criminal, you know, Criminal Minds, or some of these other other shows. That's just not not the way uh, it is in reality. Yeah, um, I just recently uh, f- uh, read uh, the book Mind Hunter. Of course, I was I was curious, like, how did that book first come together with your co-writer uh, Mark Ol- Olshaker? And- Olshaker. Yeah, and was there any concern yeah. from the FBI with some of the details that you were sharing in the book? Don't, yeah, yeah, good questions. First, the uh, with Mark Olshaker, he, he came down into the unit to do a, a show for uh, uh, public television, Nova Television, and it was going to be inside the mind of a serial killer. Mm. And we always had these media requests, and, and, and I was always against them, and pretty much the Bureau kind of was, was forcing me and my group to to do these be good publicity so he did this he spent quite a bit of time in the unit and I was getting close to retirement in 95 and so yeah I asked him I said you know hey, Mark what do you think you think there's a, a book here uh, and, and he says gee that it really seems like it let's go, you know we'll go to New York and we'll I'll let, introduce you to my agent and then we'll see what happens so that that happened and then when I went around to the, the various publishing houses uh, uh it was an easy sell because there were, and there was bidding wars really to, to, uh, you know, to publish that book because many of them, when I would go in, they'd have these other books on the table where I was referenced in these other books as involved in these, in all these other, other cases. So it started with, that's how Mark and I came together. And then, but to every, any book that you write, including my current one, the killer across the table, uh, which came out in May, mm-hmm. uh, it must go through FBI public uh, review, publication review, we call it pre-publication review process. And, and it takes them about a month to go through it. And they just want to make sure you're not revealing any kind of super-duper intelligence information. Uh, the kind of things that that, that I talked about in, in these books, it, it's... it's a lot of it, it's just investigative, it's procedural things. And if, and if someone like, say a criminal is reading the book, Mindhunter, like, like you have, or the, or even the, uh, the latest one, we've done, I've done over a dozen books, uh, the, they may try to change things or stage a crime scene, for example, and a murder. Uh, but if you're any good at what you do, and what I've seen just about anything and everything, at this point in life, uh, you can pick up on it. You 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 know, uh, you know what to look for. You know what is not right uh, here at, at this scene. Maybe the crime scene was staged, or just the way the, the suspect maybe 
uh, maybe uh, behaving. But no, the FBI review. Even if I, if I did a book on poetry, they would have to re- have to review it. Or a child's book. Yeah. I mean, there may be some subliminal message in that children's book. You know, so they they have to they review everything. Uh-huh. And, uh, and agents have gotten in in, uh, in trouble for publishing books and not going through the uh, the process of pre publication review. Yeah, uh, one of the, uh, one of the things I found really interesting in the book, and this is what kind of made me think of the question, was you know you would be talking about uh, setting up uh, the room for some of the interrogations, and uh, I don't remember which case it was, but it was on the show yeah. where you were like, put the rock over there in the corner and yes. uh, just you know let let him sweat it out. So I thought that stuff was yeah. really interesting. Yeah, because I mean, I, I, and I know the tricks because I. I I, I developed them over, over the years, but if I did something wrong and, and someone put something in the, say, the interview room that um, that is related to the crime and related to me, uh, you know, I'm not a psychopath. I, I'm going to, uh, I'll, probably, I'll probably react, you know, to, you know, to that, you know, stimulus, and and that's why with and, and it was season one. Uh, with this majorette was she was murdered and I came up with the, a the analysis of, of the crime she was like 13 14 years of age and who the offender was and and, and um, the name was Devier and, and and they came and they said John you're describing a guy who who we've interviewed and we're, and we're removing him uh, as a suspect because he just has and answers for everything. He just seems like he's not responsible. I said, and I, and I told him, I said, you mean to tell me everything that I've mentioned about this this person? It, it's fitting just about every char- uh, characteristic. Yeah, I says, well, has he lawyered up? And they said, no. I says, well, you got to bring him in. And okay, we can polygraph him. I said, no. I said, you're not <laughs> going to polygraph a guy like this because he's going to pass. He's going to pass the polygraph, or you're going to get inconclusive. And and what you're telling him is you really have nothing on him. Because if if you had something on him, you wouldn't have to use this polygraph. To me, it's just common sense kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. So looking at the the crime scene where this this 45 pound rock was used at, at, to kill this victim, he attempted manual strangulation. He couldn't complete that. So he, this rock, and so I. I visualized and walked in the shoes of the victim and the subject to, to recreate this in my mind. And as he's dropping his rock uh, one time, two times, the enemy would say it was like about four times. What's going to happen is now the victim's bleeding. You're going to get blood, uh, you know, on on himself and his clothing. So I felt if we can introduce the rock into the in, uh, interview environment, if he's the guy, uh, he is going to react to to that uh, to that rock, that, that stimulus here. If you had a hundred suspects, you bring them in one at a time, the killer will all probability respond to that. Uh, and But we're not gonna stick it under his face. So they see the show didn't really follow it in details, mm-hmm. the really the way it went down. I, I had that rock placed off in a 45 degree angle in the corner of the room where he would have to, he'd see it initially, but he's gonna have to you know, turn his body and his head to look at it. And when he went in for that, it, uh, the interview, they, they already interviewed him in the past. And when they called me later on, they, they tell me the success they had, and they got the confession. They said, "John, we were just shocked. He, t- he totally changed the way uh, the way uh, he, he has been in these other interviews." And not only that, John, he says, "We also uh, he was a suspect in a, in another city." In Rome, Georgia, this was in Adairsville, Georgia. In Rome, Georgia, a couple of, uh, a couple of years earlier, and never they never could pin it on him. He said uh, they got a hint to confess confession, uh, you know, as well. And it's a confession not with the rubber hose, or it's not the, the you know, it's like the drag net with the light shining in the guy's yeah. face or anything like that. We, you know, I, I, the cops will want to do that, and and I just uh, don't do that. I I, I create a very relaxed uh, type of you know, type of environment, but I may put a stimulus in there that only that will offend and may and may respond to. And I and I really get into that in my current book, The Kill Across the Table, uh, where I there are different approaches that that I use. Mm. So I'll be talking about all those kind of things probably with the uh, 
the audience up in Edmonton yeah. and scare the dickens out of all of them. <laughs> you know, don't, don't go back to the United States and leave you all yeah. trembling. <laughs> well, it's, well, it's interesting because your presentation is only like, I think, three days before Halloween, so it's almost a perfect fit. Oh, it is? I didn't realize it. You know, yeah. Sometimes I've had that one time where Universally booked me on, on Hall- Halloween. Uh, you know, that's, uh, that'll be... That'll be interesting. <laughs> so you've mentioned the uh, Netflix series Mindhunter, which recently released huh. the second season. How did that show come together? Because there's some really big names that have been involved with the production of that show. Yeah, the well, Fincher c- can't do them all. I mean, <laughs> he's, just, he's just so busy. So he does, he'll he'll do three of them, and but they brought in all these other directors who uh, have. Yeah, they have glowing rep- reputations uh, as well. But he still has his hand uh, in all of the the, uh, the episodes. In this case, not the the nine ep- nine episodes. Um, but he he was um, I met him year, some years ago when his name was Charlie Theron. Charlie Theron, the actress, you know, she's on option the book just about I don't know, it's, time flies. It maybe eight years, nine nine years ago. So I met her. Uh, and then it was, by the way, very beautiful in, that, <laughs> out there, in Malibu. And then we went over to meet uh, David Fincher. And Fincher was going to put this show up on uh, HBO, but they were making them wait and wait and wait. And finally he uh, said enough and he took it over to, uh, uh, you know, over to Netflix. And, and, with, and then he brought in the actors and uh, some of which, like Holt McCallany, who plays my partner in, you know, in, in the show, had worked with uh, Fincher in the past, and and uh, and his idiosyncrasies or how he repeats over and over again a scene. I mean, in fact, in season two, there was one scene, the, the first episode, of the barbecue scene, where they're cooking in the backyard. The neighbors are asking about his job, yeah. Bill Pench's job. That that was repeated seventy times. No. Uh, they said it almost broke a record from season one. <laughs> Some other scene in season one, which was like seventy-two times, wow. so 70, uh, 70 times. So, so they follow they they follow, they. They follow the book, but they, uh, but they, you know, like the Atlanta child killings. I was heavily involved in the in, the, in that case for, for months and months and months. But how I got involved in the case is not like the way he got involved. Uh, uh, you know, my Holden Ford, not the character portraying uh, portraying me. I was brought in on the case because he came up with a, a federal violation. We're looking for a violation. It was the kidnapping. And that's how I got the, the word at kid, Atlanta kidnapping. So the acronym is at kid. Uh, so it wasn't a kidnapping. We could get involved in domestic police cooperation, but they came up with a civil rights uh, violation to get us involved in it. And uh, I'll tell you, when uh, when I went down there, I, I was not warmly uh, welcomed, uh, you know, at all. Uh, when I when I went down there, and because I had already done in, an interview. At the request of the bureau, they wanted me to do an interview with People Magazine, and, and later on, you know, why did you talk to People Magazine? Why did you? Because you told me to talk to People Magazine, and you had a, a, someone in, in the office from Public Affairs listening to the whole the whole interview. Because in that interview, I, I describe who the the offender is going to be, and and he's going to be a, a black. Offender. We had the word African American back then, mm-hmm. so it'll be a black male in his age group in his twenties. He's a police buff, and that's police type vehicle. Maybe impersonating a police officer, and you know, he'll probably go the whole route with the police dog. And uh, there was no evidence these crimes were being sexually motivated, or sexual motivation. So there's something else going on there. So, so when I went down there, and you had a, you know, the, the victim is a black. The police are predominantly black uh, police department. The commissioner is black. The chief of police is black. The agent in charge of the FBI office is black. And here comes me coming down there and, and saying this, uh, you know, and uh, we didn't have many black serial killers up to that, you know, to that point uh, at all. And the bureau, I mean, they were just, you know, scared to death. Say, to say the, the least, you know, are you sure you know what you're doing? What are you, what are you doing? You know, yeah, we're going to send your butt out to Butte, Montana to work cattle wrestling cases if you screw up this this thing. In fact, it was actually worse than that. I mean, they were they were just kind of shaking in the boots. And then yeah. 
But then when I concluded too that, uh, and I had another agent uh, uh, with me, uh, and we concluded that, uh, that those cases were cannot be all be attributed to Wayne Wayne Williams. We only saw a handful of the cases that the other cases uh, were. There are other perpetrators involved, and we also saw that every year in Atlanta there was about a, a dozen child murders to begin with uh, in uh, in uh, Detroit. Many of them were were interpersonal uh, violence crimes, domestic crimes within families. So it's, the subjects are families, friends, or things along uh, you know people along those lines. So that that whole that process, you know, getting uh, I got involved in the case. It's different, but the the, the problems, the, the crosses to make the crosses, uh, mm -hmm. that's true. Where you see him uh, comes up with the idea of crosses because I I knew from research that these killers, if anything, they would go to the gravesite, they would go to any memoriam, and what better uh, what what better thing could they get would be a souvenir of crime that they perpetrated. So I wanted to have these small crosses made. And uh, it became it became a debate in the bureau, who was going to make the crosses? Was it going to be the exhibit section in Washington D.C., or is it, uh, or is it going to be a carpentry shop at the FBI Quantico? I mean, it's just analysis paralysis. <laughs> Nothing gets done. So, so eventually, you just you, you don't even ask for permission. You just wait and you screw up. You ask for forgiveness, uh, and, and but so we never got around to do. <laughs> to make to make the crosses and do those kind of things, and I had, I had a whole bunch of other uh, techniques before he was going to be identified. But mm -hmm. but we also suggested a stake out the river. Uh, that was that was suggested, uh, and and that's where they'll get uh, Wayne Williams up on top of the bridge after they hear a splash. Mm -hmm. And um, but we that was suggested because when I heard the medical examiner shooting his mouth off, that we were getting hair and fiber evidence off the bodies. Uh, because they were out in open view or, or being secreted into in wooded areas, um, I felt he now is going to wash the, 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 that evidence away. So that's why they, they end up staking out the uh, the Chattahoochee River at, at the bridges with police cadets, police officers, FBI agents. And it was about the about the third day when they were ready to kick, you know, you know, terminate this. Nothing had happened. That's when that night they heard uh, they heard the splash and. Two days later, they come up with a, a body, and they later would find another body in that river at the same, where, you know, same location. But as far as him, uh, they and they made a mistake. They did, they should have brought him in for interrogation. Yeah. They didn't do it. Uh, they let him go. Uh, next thing, they're surveilling him. Uh, a bumper lock surveillance, we call it, where he we call it. He knows we're watching him, and and he's burning stuff in his backyard. And later on, they find out it's. He's burning papers. He's burning films, photos back there. Uh, so, um, and and we made a mistake. We I did not get involved in any, any of your interrogation, like it shows in, in the Netflix show. Mm -hmm. show but the, uh, the, the the people who did the interview, um, the, the 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 method was uh, uh, it just was was too in, in your face. So it was just too too direct. Uh, what I what I saw, and they, they, totally a different approach, and they never asked for, for any guidance. Uh, so that because I, I really believe they could have gone uh, that night, and they, so they didn't. So the next thing you got to do is rely on forensic evidence, mm -hmm. and which they uh, they did do to mm -hmm. link the, the, the. But they only linked they only they got them on two murders and linked them they, forensically, hair and fiber evidence on about ten, yeah. uh, uh, ten cases. Uh, do you think there was more than ten that he actually killed? No, I don't, I don't believe. Well, I don't believe of the of the, that group that we're looking at. There was like twenty eight. Now mm -hmm. there may be others before uh, nineteen. You know, uh, before uh, the nineteen ninety one uh, when he started. Not not ninety one, eighty one, eighty one. There may be some before then that would never even put on the you know, you know on the list. So. What they're doing now is they they're going through they mean in the the Atlanta police are going through the entire case because the families know too that and I've written about this that the, there isn't any uh, ending or so I'm not going to say closure that's a bad word it's never closure for these victims' families but uh, they that they still are, believe that Williams is not responsible for 
you know, for all of the, uh, of the homicides, mm-hmm. you know, you know, down there. But unfortunately, it's oftentimes you'll see, you may see a police agency clear the books uh, to get to get a good clearance rate, so they'll clear the, the books and attribute these crimes to uh, to the uh, the offender, you know, even though he never confessed to him, but but just just want to cl- clear the slate, which is uh, which is wrong. Yeah. Uh, just getting back to your to your book a little bit. Uh, one of my one of the parts I really enjoyed the most in the book was when you were talking about when you first started with the FBI. J. Edgar Hoover was in charge, and you were talking about kind of uh, how strict it was. Uh, can you share, I guess, with some of our listeners the differences uh, of uh-huh. working under J. Edgar yeah. Hoover versus what it was like uh, yeah. when you retired? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's just. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I, like I said, I joined. I joined the FBI twenty five. I was only twenty five years of age when, when I joined. And then I come back. I just came out of the Air Force. Was in graduate school. Dropped out of graduate school. I would later on pick up an advanced degree. So, uh, so when I, I saw him at, at the FBI uh, at headquarters. I saw. I didn't talk to him. He didn't talk to our class. I never personally met him. But the fear that surrounded him and, and the agents. Uh, so when I got to Detroit, my first field office, and we were going to be under an inspection. Field offices go through inspections like once every two years or so. Uh, agents uh, agents uh, are shaking in their boots. Mm-hmm. They could be censured. Maybe they screwed up on the case. They did something wrong administratively. And it's always this don't embarrass the Bureau. And, you know, Whatever you do, don't embarrass, uh, you know, the bureau. I mean, and so in those days, man, they would you could get transferred. Uh, there were times, you know, if your child got in trouble, uh, they would transfer you. They transfer the whole family, yeah, you know, out of uh, out of a, a, a community. And if they ever caught you doing anything not quite um, uh, by the book, you, I mean, uh, it could be hell hell for you. So after he died, he died in '72. It didn't change really, uh, you know, right, right away, because you still have all these people in that mindset within in the organization. Then it began; it was, those people began to retire. But there's still, um, you see, I, I always went against things, and that's why, yeah, and that's why I was always in controversy in the bureau. Uh, and I, if I didn't see something I, 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 going right, I would speak up, and that would get me, you know, in trouble. And the only reason they tolerated me, though, after a while, is because I got good, really good at what I did, and, and so they, they like to kick me in my ass, but but really, I'm, I'm good at what I, I do, so they have to put, you know, put up with me, you know, once in a while. So even when I retired in 95, uh, it's still, I mean, it's still... And I, and I still, I'll say today, I've been out of the Bureau for so many years, but we've seen some of the things and the goings on in, uh, in, in Washington, D.C., the, the FBI and, and some of the directors and the agents and the, and the presidential election. It's it's uh, just disgraceful. And you still have that kind of that you always may have all that, that good old boy uh, kind of mentality where someone gets in a, in a, in a position of hierarchy in an organization, they bring in their buddies they, because they trust their buddies, yeah. which is bad. It's a, a, a bad, uh, you know, concept and principle to, uh, you know, to follow, you know, to follow here. So it's, you don't have the Jade go Hoover you know, type of thing. And it's not, uh, it's, it's changed. Uh, it, it's changed, uh, you know, since, since those days, but, but yeah, Hoover, you know, it was, a, he was a piece of work. I guess I, I just didn't understand understand it when I when I joined it, and then but then I understood when I got to Detroit and, and then Milwaukee too the same things. So, oh my God, these grown men are, are scared to death of this guy. Yeah. I thought you mentioned something in the book too about like you guys couldn't smoke or drink coffee or something like that. Oh, gee, yeah. In fact, in fact, two years before I got in, you had to wear a hat. You had to wear, <laughs> you know, this is like this is like dragnet you yeah. know this is you know, you know so you had you know, so you had if they if you didn't come to work you had they sent you home you got to get to get your hat you can't you can't drink coffee uh, forget smoking forget that all yeah. the right you cannot drink coffee in the uh, in the office when i got from detroit uh and got transferred there i was in violent crime in detroit went to violent crime uh case in milwaukee i, I I'm, I'm sitting in my i just got there i'm sitting in the office and the agent charge tells her what are you doing here 
and I said, I just got here. I'm just uh, going through you know, my material cases. And he says, get out of here. Get out of the office. I, I, don't, I don't have a car. I, I don't have a car. I, I don't care. Out of the office. So I, I'd leave the office, and I'm walking the streets of Milwaukee, you know, so you'll see other agents. And so you'll, so we end up meeting or maybe work on our cases and uh, written uh, uh, written work at a library, a local uh, library. It was it was screwy, uh, you know, back then. In fact, you know, it, it, when I went to first Detroit, we had uh, cars uh, that didn't uh, didn't have air conditioners. And they're always dark colored cars. So hot as heck in the summertime. And then they started putting air conditioning in cars. Uh, and it was, it was stock air conditioners. Hoover would make the manufacturers take the air conditioners out of the cars uh, for us. Until finally one day someone had the guts enough to go up there and tell them, sir, you know, it's, it's costing more <laughs> to remove the air conditioners than it is to have the air conditioners. So we finally got, you know, air conditioning in cars. So, yeah, there were times when I joined the Bureau, I said, what the hell did I get myself into here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so true crime genre has been popular for a long time, but in, in recent years it seems to have really kind of blown up with the different shows on Netflix and podcasts like My Favorite Murder. What are your thoughts on the popularity of, of true crime since there is a victim side to the stories that are being talked about? Right, and I think, I, I, in fact, what I like about uh, Netflix season two is we're getting into the victims because we we'll always we make these the, the bad guys up more times than not, like the uh, celebrity. I did a, a, a crime conference up in uh, Toronto uh, not too long ago. I did one in uh, London, England, and I did one in uh, New York City. I'm just one of a one of a, gr- a group of different people going in there, and it, it's shocking the amounts of people that that show up who are really, I mean, they know every, not serial killer, they know his first name, middle name, and last name, you know, I mean, I don't even know all of that. And, and but the audience is about, about 80% women, uh, you know, too. And, and the reason for that, well, women are just intuitive. I've had some very good profilers that were, were women, but they also, they, 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 they are thinking like the way I thought when I, when I first decided to do this and, and it's the why plus how equals who. And so, you know, why, what, what is the motivation here be, with this, with this, and we'll say men, in most of the cases we get are the subjects in these kind of cases are going to be men. Uh, you know, what, what, what created them? Is it a nature thing, nature thing? Uh, what, what precipitated this? this person to commit the crimes he did. Why did he do it? Uh, what was his behavior, pre-offense behavior, po- post-offense behavior? And it's like, it's like a detective crime, you know, crime story. Uh, but these women are the victims of these crimes. And, and I'll, you know, I'll probably address that too. And, and uh, Edmund, uh, I'm not, uh, look, uh, I mean, like, for example, in the area of rape, uh, of, of how these victim selection and the various types of rapists that there are. Uh, everyone thinks that, oh, I, I did in my unit did a, in a career with serial serial murder cases. And that's false. Uh, uh, most of the cases were were single cases, but unusual cases. And then, but we also did serial rape uh, cases, and we did research of serial rapists. We interviewed men who raped uh, five or more victims. We interviewed 50, uh, 50 of them, and we also I, I had arson bombing, uh, you know, programs. And we interviewed arsonists. We interviewed. Uh, bombers. We were product tampering cases, extortion cases, kidnapping, uh, you know, cases. It's really the criminal mind, and that's what people are fascinated uh, by, you know, by that. And and when they see someone like a Ted Bundy, uh, who good-looking guy. I mean, do they have the right guy? Do they arrest the right guy? I mean, he looks he they, he looks like us, and but he's uh, obviously, you know, he's different. You know why? You know, why is he, you know, he's different. So I try to make, when I go out and talk, I try to make it, um, of course, it is an entertainment component, but I, I always try to make it educational, whether it's in a presentation or it's in a, uh, or writing a book. I mean, to learn something, what can we learn, you know, from, uh, you know, from these people? And maybe if, I, I've had people write me letters and say, John, based upon some of the books you've written, I, I, I've always thought, I, I always go in, I get in a situation and 
thinking the worst that what could possibly happen here if I, um, you know, if my car breaks down on the highway and I'm, I'm alone or if I'm walking in this underground parking garage, what should I be doing? What should I be, be looking for? Uh, you know, and, and so it's, it's really gratifying to see how it's helped, you know, people, you know, over the years and it kept them in, in tune with their, you know, their surroundings. So this, it's, it's booming. And, uh, you have a very successful podcast. Uh, my, my, uh, United Talent Agency and my speakers bureau, they, um, they've been after me for two years to do a podcast and now they, they're in the process of, of putting together, uh, you know, the development of that and a, and a production company, mm. um, to, the, to come out with a podcast in the next month or so. Apparently, but I really don't know anything about how these podcasts work. <laughs> well, you neither know, do I. Know. That's all gross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know. Well, you know, some people could do it in the basement of their house. You know, yeah. they, they want to do like a Cecil B. DeMille's production. They want to have the, <laughs> you know, you know, like come in like playing tapes of different things or yeah. interviews. So, but I can't do. I, you need a production company for that. I, I don't know. How to, well, I, I just want to talk. <laughs> well, Caroline and I would definitely subscribe. And if you need any help, I am more than happy to volunteer my services. All right. <laughs> help you out good. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. So speaking of like podcasters and, and bloggers, um, I guess, how do you feel about uh, like pod other podcasters, such as obviously uh, the Atlanta Monster podcast, yeah. those sort of uh, people, I guess, starting to do kind of their own investigating into uh, past yeah. crimes? Yeah, there's another one. Uh, yeah, I, I know that uh, Atlanta Monster one, the Billy Jensen. He teamed up with uh, with the Golden Gate uh, police officer Paul Holes, H O L E S. They have a podcast. I've done wine and crime. I've done all you know different. Had me for for interviews, uh, uh, but but there are some that like the Atlanta Monster. Where they, I think it's uh, I I think it's good. As fact, as a matter. Of, they, you just don't want you don't want to have people interfering with an investigation, mm -hmm. but it it gets an investigation off the ground again, where people, you know, well, the Atlanta case, well, it's, it's solved. You know, I, I, the, my understanding is is that the police are even going to uh, the creators of uh, of that particular podcast to uh, gather information that that they have uh, received uh, in their investigation, what they got from. Uh, you know, from Williams, uh, I did an interview just not uh, about this year because I met them. I, I met the, the the lead guy, and, and I didn't want to really participate in that when they first asked me. But they, I, I met them, and I, I agreed to do it. So I'm on that podcast where they ask me questions, uh, and it's some, the last. I guess it's the last one of the Atlanta Monster mm -hmm. one about the case. So I have, have no problem with it. Uh, it, it. It can help. It can help uh, as long as you just, like I said, you don't interfere with the police uh, investigation. Yeah. Yeah, obviously the Golden State yeah. Killer w one was another one, too, that yeah. uh, with uh, with the book I'll Be Gone in the Dark, that really helped ignite um, that investigation. Obviously, they, yeah. they caught the guy, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I, you know, because I get so, so many people writing letters or emails or Facebook, and it's so frustrated. Their their loved one had died, and the case is old. I'm I was dealing with someone just today, this morning, you know, here, and uh, the police, you know, they may have screwed the case up when this when this murder went down. This guy believes that this relative was involved, was a serial killer, uh, and he, he has some pretty. Good information there, but he's he's very fr frustrated. The police, they may not want anyone to take a look at the case. I mean, they could have the bureau come in to provide assistance, you know, to them. Uh, and uh, I told them to go to uh, to the local police, uh, excuse me, local newspaper. And if you have a, a investigative reporter, he or she may be interested. In it. And that's one way of getting the case. It puts pressure on the local police. That if some investigative reporter is, is writing about this and, and digging to see what went right, what went wrong, perhaps in the investigation. So I suggest that he do that. I, I've done that with other other families, uh, you know, as you know, as well. It's real, it's real, uh, you know, sad. Uh, but we're getting better now in the forensics. The forensics is just amazing with the DNA. It's getting better and better. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to. 
to shorten the careers. I, we're not going to end serial killers. Uh, we'll shorten their careers. Uh, we don't know in, in this country or anywhere how many there are. I've always said that in the United States, 35 to 50, which I believe is a conservative estimate. Um, there is one group out of a university, as a matter of fact, in Virginia here, they they believe that maybe there could be 2,000 serial offenders. The definition used to be three or more victims. The Bureau lopped off one of the victims, so now it's two. Yeah, mm -hmm. Two victims will, uh, will mean a, a serial killer. The problem we have in the United States is different than what you, you have in your, you have these provinces up there and you have the RCMPs. And we have over 18,000 different law enforcement agencies in, in the United States. And um, they don't all communicate with one another. And so in 1983, we developed a program that, that the Canadians will take and, and do a better job out of it. And we had what was called VICAP, Violent Criminal Apprehension Program, which is a computerized program, and police are supposed to submit their cases to, to us, we punch the data and see if there's any similarities of, of uh, other cases around the United States here. Well, it's, been, it, it's not been successful because uh, it's a voluntary program. And because it's voluntary, it does no good yeah, when one city participates in it and the adjoining city uh, you know, does not. You need all of them. And we've supplied even the, 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 hard, uh, the hardware and software uh, you know, to them. And so here we get the RCMPs come down and, and as well as Toronto police, we trained uh, various uh, officers. They came, to, came down and we put them in an internship program. So you have criminal profilers up in Canada, but you also have the violent uh, classification system. But what they did is you, you took our, our program and developed your own program and you made it a, a a mandatory program up there, so therefore, it's it's a much more successful program. I thought by now, we not only would have murderers in there, but we would have other all interpersonal crime, uh, crimes, interpersonal violent crimes, like we'd have rapes in there, arson cases, whatever, a child um, uh, human trafficking, child exploit like exploitation of children, and and it hasn't, it just hasn't happened, uh, you know, at all, uh, but. But you're you're ahead of uh, you're ahead of us, and even though we created, we started. <laughs> you guys, you, you got it going up there, and yeah, really very good uh, police uh, the police departments there. Uh, uh, once in a while, they make goof up on something like uh, over in Vancouver when you had that guy Picton mm -hmm. oh, yeah. up there. Remember, you know Picton, yeah, yes. uh, killer. Yeah, yeah the you forget him. Gee, yeah. Terrible. Uh, I was up there giving the talk. And the media grabbed a hold of me, and he said, "What about?" He said, "What about these cases? We have these missing, uh, missing victims up here. And what do you think?" I said, well, "I said, you give me any city where you have runaways. They call them throwaways today. Uh, where you have a drug culture. You have street uh, homeless people. You have uh, there's prostitution. These are fertile grounds for a serial killer. And so you can't tell me that you know that you, you don't have at least." one serial killer operating up here. And it was after that, that's when we came up, or well, not us came up, they, they finally uh, uh, came up with the name Picton. But they, were, they, weren't really, they weren't really investigating those cases uh, that strongly. And unfortunately, sometimes that's because, and it's terrible, it's because who the victims are. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's like they, these, these are forgotten victims, you know, like nobody cares, nobody knows where they are, they could have just left, you know. So it's, they don't, uh, certain departments you may find or in the United States as well uh, they don't uh, do a full coat of press you know on these uh, on those kind of cases it doesn't it doesn't reach that high priority like another case mm -hmm. would mm -hmm. unless they put unless there's political pressure on uh, uh, put on them from the yeah especially up here there's a lot of cases involving uh, missing and murdered indigenous women I know those uh, yes. those cases unfortunately don't really get the the press that they really should and um, I know there's there's a ton of cases where they're just apparently cold that's right it's up, it's above that north country up, yeah. up there uh, yeah and 
well, there's a lot of drilling being done. It's the, uh, you know, it's the, the guys with the Marlboro tattoos, you know, the macho guys. We had a, we saw the same thing happen uh, in Alaska uh, that when when it came up with the pipeline up to to there, and you had people coming up to call from the lower 48 up uh, up to Alaska, and no no due diligence done on these characters. Many of them made a lot of money. They had a lot of down downtime, a lot of free time, and uh, we had a lot of a lot of cases uh, you know, to them. So I know I was up because I, I have a son going to school now over in Halifax at mm. Mount St. Vincent University. He's starting school over there. We were just up there; it was beautiful, uh, and um, and I was just researching us all around and some of my other travels in Can- in Canada. And I've seen that. That's a, a problem, you know, up. Uh, you know, up there because when I was up there, it was those two teenagers you know, they were looking for, yeah. and they went up in that area too. And they went up north, and they killed a couple of people, an Australian and an American. They killed, mm-hmm. and those two guys I think they committed suicide. Those two teenagers, yeah, I think yeah, so. this was, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a shame, but yeah, they. Uh, that, um, but you see that, I mean, you see it uh, there, and you see it in our country as well, unfortunately. In your career, was there anyone that you wanted to interview that that you didn't get a chance to? Yeah, it would have been uh, several, but I, I, I would have liked to interview uh, the Green River Killer, uh, Gary Ridgway, in Seattle, Washington, because I nearly died on, on that case, and and <clears throat> I was working uh, cases like you know so many cases, and and that and that part of what you're saying, although not to the extreme of Holden Ford in in the Mindhunter series on Netflix, uh, but I was just over and worked. And when I went out on my, I was out there several times in Seattle. When I went this, I, I felt something was going to happen uh, to me. And I just, um, health-wise, because the, the week before I was in New York training New York City cops and during my presentation, I had this anxiety attack. I thought I was, I was going to die. And no one even picked up. Probably, uh, no one saw anything. I, because I, I just know my materials. So my mouth is moving, but my brain is a hundred miles away, and I'm sweating. My heart is pounding because I, you know, I, I just, I'm, I'm just on overload, overload. And then, so when I when I got back to Quantico, I took out extra life insurance. And the day I I left to go, I said goodbye to my wife and family two times I'm like why are you telling me this you know I went by the school where she's teaching to say goodbye and so when I went out there uh, uh, went before the task force had two two new agents assigned to my unit and and uh, that uh, in fact I was in the unit chief and I was a program manager uh, that night I told the agents I think I'm getting uh, the flu I said just leave uh, you know leave me alone it's it's Tuesday night come get me Friday we'll head back to uh uh, to, to DC. Well, that night I collapsed in my hotel room. A vile encephalitis brought on by me said that my immune system was low. I was under a tremendous amount of stress. I remained on that floor for three days uh, before they came to get me because I had the not disturb sign on the door. And then the agents thought they were just going to leave me alone because trying to get me. You know, I was I'm sick. Mm-hmm. And so, um, uh, so. <laughs> Nearly died. I came out of the coma. I was in a coma for a week. Came out of it at that time paralyzed. Had to go through months and months of rehabilitation. But but he was the guy that. that and uh, I really wanted to. And he got he got uh, arrested after my retirement. You know, not that many years ago. And he fessed up to a lot of cases. But I would really I would really like to dig deep into him um, in. Uh, the, the, not just the whys of his behavior, but the, the things that could help in the future, other cases, pre-defense behavior, post-defense behavior, some of the things uh, you know that he did with the victims, um, the whys of his behavior. So he would he would have been uh, Gary Ridgway, a, a good one, as well as I I, I think uh, Wayne Williams. Unlike in the show, I never you know I, I didn't really in, interview him. I never got to interview him. Work the case. I, I coached the prosecution uh, during uh, during the trial, uh, and uh, did, a, did a lot of that that work. But uh, and I know he would want to he would want to uh, talk to me because he, he he's not exactly thrilled, you know, you know, with me. Because yeah. one of the things I did was I I coached the, one of the prosecutors who was good to cross examine him 
got to cross-examine him, and uh, and he followed the suggestions, and, and which was to hold Williams's hand, because Williams, the day before, the, the defense team held Williams's hands and showed the jurors, are these the hands? Do these look like the hands of a serial killer? So they, uh, look at him, he looks like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Does this look like a serial killer? So I, I told Jack Mallard, the, one of the, uh, the district attorneys down there, to, to do the same thing, hold his hands. The only difference, Jack, is that in a, in a real low voice, you could say, what was it like, Wayne, when you wrapped your fingers around Terry Pugh's throat? Did you panic, Wayne? Did you panic? And he said, no, in a very low voice, you know, low. And then he caught himself, and then he gets up uh, out of the, uh, the witness box, and he starts screaming and yelling, and I know you got that FBI profile over there, and you're, gonna try, you're trying to get me to fit that profile, I'm not going to fit it. And, and then here, everyone in the courtroom and the jurors are looking like, oh my, oh, look at this guy. Yeah. And uh, that was his, that was his downfall when when he elected to take the stand and i knew he would take the stand but it, that was his you know his downfall yeah uh just uh before we get into kind of our final questions uh just a really quick one i guess about the difference uh, differences between uh the your book, Mindhunter, and the TV show. Uh, when I first started watching it, I was like, oh, that's that's odd that Holden Ford isn't named uh, John Douglas. Was that just so you guys could take a little bit more dramatic yeah. liberties with the show? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Because <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll probably tell the people in, in uh, well, I guess Edmonton, too, and I did a presentation. Because when, when I saw, like, um, they, it gives them the liberty to do what they want. Yeah. Like, I was married. I had married and had had one uh, one child at that point in time okay. at 32. My wife was five years younger than me, so we're watching season one and uh, in a sex scene, yeah. a sex scene in season <laughs> season one. My wife, my wife says, "Is that you know?" That's what his girlfriend, you know, is trying to teach. Is that supposed to be me? And so I asked me, to, I said, well, it sure as hell isn't me. You know, <laughs> in that scene. That scene. So it, it was just, uh, yeah, so it gives them, it gives them that, uh, that you know, they Hollywoodize things, but the general, the premise, the concept, the interviews, the, the way the interviews are uh, kind of like that. Although with Charles Manson, I was, I was uh, Bill Tench, lost it, you know, with uh, the Charles Manson interview, uh, because he's got a lot going on in his own personal life. Uh, but in reality, when, uh, when we did that interview, uh, the it was a real cordial interview. He did sit up on top of a chair to dominate to dominate us, and I knew he would he would do that. Man, so he's only five two. I'm six two, mm -hmm. and so and so if he didn't do it, I'd be surprised because he did it at the George Spawn. Uh, George Spine Ranch. So they give, and so like, you know, and Wendy, the, the psychologist, that's Ann Burgess. She's not a lesbian. Ann Burgess from Boston College. She's, she's married with a couple of kids. So Wendy, she's a, a lesbian in there. And then to Bill Tench, we never, he never had trouble with his kid like that, uh, with his son. And it can, but that's based on a true case, oh. a true case out of uh, California where, uh, where this, these two brothers killed a young child in the basement, uh, a 20-month-old toddler who they lured away from a mother who was sunbathing in a park and took her down the basement and then and then they killed the child and then attached the child to a cross, thinking the child was going to be resurrected. So that they so they that's they do change things like that, you know, and and the complexity of the of the personalities, but. Um, yeah, but as far as you know, the, everything else, the, we're going to get to the, uh, you know, to the goal. It's just a, they may be going a different way than, uh, and sometimes than the, the route that I, that I took. Yeah, and but it's pretty good. It's pretty factual, uh, different than some of the other shows. Mm -hmm. Where you know, where my car like FBI profiles are kicking down doors, running around with guns. <laughs> now, when you get back, to, it's it's more cerebral, cerebral type of work when you. When you get back, you leave the. I mean, so I've, you've gone and everything, but it's still you don't. Uh, you're not. You're not taking cases away from police. You are. You are assisting police. You're mm -hmm. a coach for police. You're a coach for the FBI agents or the Secret Service agents or alcohol Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Because you're coaching them 
you don't and you don't take away you don't do the the interviews if you did all the interviews you'd be in court half your uh, your life and yeah. they have capable people doing the interviews but you may what you may do is and sometimes if they don't like it is that the, the the detective working the case may not be the right person to do the interview and you got to tell them or the agent doing this this investigation uh, you did a great job but you're, you're you're really not the personality type you're not the right gender you're not the right age group for you know, uh, to whatever to, to do the interview sometimes they get mad they don't like that but it's just the way. It's just <laughs> what you're suggesting, you know. Uh, you know, to the investigators. Yeah. Uh, one last question about season two: uh, the character of Jim Barney is that supposed to be Judson Ray? I I, I think I guess so because Judson. I mean, who knows whether you? Because know, Judson came in, uh, and, we, and we did know him. Uh, we met through the, the Columbus Strangling Strangler case when he was a a, a, a street a street uh, detective uh, down there before he came into the FBI. So I think so because, because I, I've, I've talked about Judd and, and, um, and he had an interesting case, as you know, in the, in the mind Hunter book where yeah. his wife contracted to have him killed. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, uh, they may, they may kind of segue into that yeah. along the, uh, you know, when the time comes. Uh, but yeah, he was a, he was a great uh, agent in the, uh, in the unit, I had uh, I had women about of a dozen agents. I, anyway, I had about, about there wasn't a lot of women in the bureau back then, but I had about three three of the dozen were, were women uh, agents, and and we had John uh, Judd, African American. We had Hispanics. You know, it looked like a McDonald's commercial. I mean, <laughs> we had they were, they were, they were, they were, number one. They were great. They were all great street agents, great investigators, risk, kind of risk takers. But yeah, but kind of not a uh, but a calculated risk taker, uh, who, you know, and but who's not afraid to make a make a decision because sometimes I get agents back there they just don't uh, they, they they follow what's being said but they don't speak up first they they don't they don't not showing leadership because when you go out on these cases and you go before a task force I mean you got you got to you can't oversell yourself you have to show you have to show leadership uh, but not you know, not, not don't come across like a used car salesman, but just you know, leadership. And if you and when you don't know something, you tell them, "I don't know. Uh, I I don't know. I can't answer that question. I really can't do, for example, a detailed profile. It would fit too many people in, in uh, downtown Edmonton. Uh, but what I can do, uh, it, I could say is, well, here are some proactive techniques. Maybe we can flush this person out." Uh, here is the arrest was made. Here are some suggestions for the interview. And then Mr. Crown Attorney, when you take him to trial, here are some suggestions. Uh, if you believe he takes a stand, how to approach him when he takes a stand. So you can do all those those kind of things. So I'll probably go through that a lot. My big thing when I do these presentations is the time. I, I could speak for, for a long time. And, and I got to do a, a keynote in Houston for 25 minutes. I, I can't talk just for 25 minutes. I don't know how the heck I'm, I'm going to do that. You know? well, we could we could definitely talk to you all day. We've got just a couple of uh, quick, short yeah. questions to wrap up our interview with you. Yeah. So our first one: yeah. Do you have a favorite fictional detective? Not, not real. I, I kind of. Uh, uh, not a fictional be detective. Uh, I'm trying to think. I, God, I, I just threw a blank on, on my mind. Uh, a female, and she worked out of Richmond. Patsy Cornwell. She, she oh, yes. and, and the, yeah. uh, the writer Patricia Cornwell. Yeah. She was really good. And then the other one, a uh, woman. She's a forensic anthropologist. Uh, and uh, I can't think. It's been a while since I've read the books. Kathy but those, I mean, I like the, those kind of. You know those kind of uh, books. I really don't get a chance to read because uh, I'm, I'm usually I'm reading up on cases and things. So, and then when I do read, you know, I just I just went to Kindle to see what I had on there. And you would think I'm, I'm a serial killer or some wacko <laughs> if you see the books because it's all true crime. So I wanted yeah. like women who, who uh, love men uh, who kill, uh, and which I've come across is fascinating. And then, then another one, uh, uh, that book was by Sheila Eisenberg, and then there's one, Violence uh, in, in uh, Animal Cruelty Offenders. 
because I, I've seen a connection between, for years, animal cruelty mm-hmm. and violent offenders. In fact, the SPCA in uh, outside of Toronto had me up two years in a row, great people, really nice people, and uh, because they, uh, your SPCA actually has investigative arm to it. They can investigate these cases. Mm-hmm. So they they were up on the fact that I've done this research. That, that was always the questions we would ask violent offenders, and we always saw a pattern in, uh, in violent uh, 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 cruelty against animals. In fact, after all so many years, I mean, we were doing this research in the, in the late 70s, in the 80s. Just a year ago, the FBI now tracks uh, animal cruelty cases. And, and to, to see the pattern and, and trend, uh, it was never tracked before. Uh, when a police officer had, say, a domestic violence case where the guy kills the woman's dog, they wouldn't. They would have put it under other. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't know what what is other. So now we track it, and so it just it'll be something to see. You know, it is you know when we when there's a case leads uh, developing leads. If we see a so and so lives in this area here and this is his history uh so they, they never did that before so um that was kind of you know interesting uh you know so i so i yeah and amanda knox i've i've read her book waiting to be heard because i i helped amanda knox get out of prison uh and i did a book with douglas preston and we and others and we did mostly uh to get the word out of, of, of her innocence and why she was innocent. So that's another thing I've done since I've gotten out of the Bureau. I've helped people. In, in the job in a Ramsey case, I was brought in to assist uh, the defense attorneys if I could. If I thought they were innocent and I believed the family were innocent. So I, I highly criticized by law enforcement when I did that. And then I just helped free, not just now, several years ago, uh, the West Memphis Three. Mm-hmm. And HBO did a series, Paradise Lost, uh, and uh, there's been books written, and, and then uh, uh, Peter Jackson, the director of Lord of the Rings, brought me in and a, and a whole team of forensic people uh, to look and, and work that case. And those th- three uh, teenagers, when convicted, were now uh, in their mid-30s. They spent, spent about 18 years in, in prison, uh, these guys. One on death row, two got life, and they all got out of prison. And the police just, uh, you know, Botched it. It's horrible, you know, mm-hmm. horrible case. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but the HBO mm-hmm. series was great. Mm-hmm. Um, Joe Berlinger uh, was a director uh, of that. Uh, so, will we ever see you making a um, maybe a cameo appearance on Mind Hunter? I don't know. Someone mentioned that. Maybe, maybe so. Uh, um, I, so, so far, they, like they don't even know there's a season three. Yeah. But but you know what's there's going to be a season three. Yeah. I mean, there's going to there's, and there's going to probably be a season four and five. How do I know that? Because because uh, um, David Fincher said publicly that, uh, and that, and everything's so secret now. And then when I say something, and they find out, oh, you know, you're you're not supposed to say anything. What are you talking? The actors have all talked about it. The actors were approached uh, Holt McCallany and and uh, Jonathan Groff. Uh, by Fincher, it said, you got to give me five years. You know, five years. I see a five-year arc to the show. And um, and they said, you know, okay. What, now, when I saw Jonathan drop a couple of months ago up in New York, uh, I said, Jonathan, a five-year arc? It took you t- two years to come out with season two almost. <laughs> you know, what is it, a 10-year? It 10 years to do the five-year arc. And he said, yeah, I know. He's, just, he's so particular. And, and it, it they love working for him, but uh, some actors can't work with Fincher because he's just so uh, detailed and yeah. meticulous uh, over and over. Uh, you know, so uh, yeah, so maybe there'll be a cameo. Hopefully, hopefully, it won't be like a serial killer. Right? Maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe it'll be. Kind of, <laughs> you maybe never be, know. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say maybe it'll be something really cheesy where you pass by each other yeah. in an airport or something, yeah. and you're like, "Keep your chin yeah, up, dude." Yeah, that'll be yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll be. Yeah, I'll be selling hamburgers or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Maybe so. And yeah. our, our last question is a question that we ask all the guests on Overdue Finds. And you've mentioned yeah. a few so far, so if you, you don't have one, another one, that's okay. But do you have a recent book, movie, TV show, or album that you could recommend to our listeners to check out? Jeez, I, I mean, 
I, I've been so so uh, much into our own stuff. I hate to plug my own book, but really, this other this, this, this book that's out now, uh, "The Killer Across the Table," gotten very good reviews, and, and uh, uh, people, if you're who are true crime buffs, to, to, uh, looking at the how I interview four distinct different types of of uh, offenders. One guy, let's, I'll tell you briefly, has a master's degree, he's a school teacher in New Jersey. He will kill a little girl going door to door uh, selling Girl Scout cookies. He was a high school teacher uh, living in that neighborhood. You go out to the state of Washington, uh, a guy named Joe Condro. I never had a case like this. He would kill his friend's children. Uh, and for years, this went on, uh, and never really was a suspect. Then go to uh, Ohio and Missouri, a, a, a guy uh, you know, there, Donald Harvey, he killed as many as 75 hospital patients. Uh, he was an orderly and different kind of personality. And then the, the last one, Todd Colehep in, in uh, South Carolina, 2016, they rescued a woman in a storage container uh, in uh, in South Carolina, mm-hmm. uh, store, kept in there by a guy named Todd Colehep. And Todd Colehep, uh, they rescued her, but he killed seven people. But, but he was a different kind of serial serial uh, killer. And and I profiled him for the police before he was ever even known. I was speaking down there and at a uh, at a university. And cops came up to me. Can you help us? Four people killed in this motorcycle shop. Well, I, I told them in 2004 that this was going to be either a disgruntled employee or a disgruntled customer. More probability, a customer, and he's going to be in the files. And uh, and uh, they initially started looking in the files, but they stopped looking because they had an, a, another suspect who they thought was thought was very suspicious, uh, who showed up that day. Uh, and found that the victims uh, deceased. Well, it turns out that Colehep was in those files, uh, and if they would have done credit and criminal checks, they would have seen he was a convicted. He was convicted rapist at, when he was when he was 15 years of age, raped a 14 year old in Tempe, Arizona, spent 15 years in prison, and then came back and went back to South Carolina, and where he uh, uh, picked up a couple of degrees, a real estate broker, real estate office he owned. But he has this bad habit. If you get him angry, he's going to get you. And his retali- retaliation, he'll wait. He'll wait for months and months and months. So interesting, interesting. And four different approaches of how to, how to, uh, how I did those kind of uh, you know, interviews with, uh, you know, with them. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, so other than that, I'm just like I'm. We're working on another book right now. We had we had, we had another two book deal, oh. and then with the podcast and the cases and uh, the public speaking. <laughs> Man, you know, I'm, I'm 74 years old. You know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, you gotta, gotta keep the energy up. Yeah, I was gonna keep, say. I, I, I try to work out. I try to work out almost every day just to keep the energy. I still have it. Still have, and the interest and the desire is still there to help people and help police whenever I can. Well, we're gonna. Uh, both keep our eye open for it. I've got Definitely. a copy. Oh yeah, I'll uh, let you know. Yeah, yeah I've got my own copy of uh, the Killer Across the Table, and there's a really good chance I'm probably going to ask you to sign it for me. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, good. Here next month. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, but I got these neat. Bo- I give you these neat bookmarkers. I'm going to bring too. I had oh. they cost over a dollar, dollar something a piece. I had these crazy, but it has like a gold embossed uh, FBI seal, gold leaf on oh. it, and it's and it's, and it's for uh, and it has the names of the the book, some of the cases on the other flip side that I work, then I have the Y plus how equals who. So I'll be giving those out. I'll be giving those out to people too when I'm up there. When I I sign their books, they bring their books uh, in. Yeah. And and I'll I'll, I'll pass them out. Bryce will be first in line, I'm pretty sure. My wife is a really big big fan too. She first read uh, The Anatomy of Motive. And that's after, a good one. Yeah, yeah, after she read that, she was hooked on all your stuff, and then I got yeah, that's a good I one. Got hooked as well. Mind. Yeah, certain ones are better than others, and that's yeah, that's a, a, another one is Law and Disorder, and yeah. we just the publisher just did not uh, give us the full court press on that was a different publisher, and that I mean, I, I mean those that's the case a book where I just dressed uh, I addressed Amanda Knox case and mm-hmm. and the, uh, uh, and the West Memphis three case and. and uh, John Benet Ramsey and other cases I was involved with all 
it was a, a great book and uh, great reviews. But man, you really need the a publisher to push you. A, a push. You're not James Patterson. You know. Uh, you know. Uh, you know. A, a name recognition. Mm-hmm. You know. You, you have to let people know there's a there's a book. You know. Yeah. Out. You know. Out there. So they use social media. That's another. Uh, in, in the old days where they used to fly around. But you got within. To use a social media, get you know, line stuff up, and that's unfortunately they, you know, they didn't uh, do that. But that's a that's a, a good one, and then the current one is a good one. Some that you know like better than you know than others. No, well, we so, are... man, thank you. Yeah, and I'll be glad to sign them <laughs> for, for you. Perfect well, for your wife too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you yeah. so much again for thank your time. You. Oh, nice, You're Bryce. Very generous, nice, Carolyn. With it. And uh, yeah, we'll look forward to uh, chatting with you in person in uh, late October. Well, that's great. I look forward to it. Okay. And congratulations with your podcast here. Thank you, and we look forward Continue to yours. Success, yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. All right. Have a great Bye. day. Caroline, uh, yeah, I just what do you I, say? I'm speechless. Just absolutely fascinating, and uh, he was so generous with his time. So generous, and uh, just an amazing interview. Uh, no, it was incredible as we were going through his willingness to share his experiences and talk on a number of different topics. I really liked hearing about the strictness of the FBI when yeah. he first joined and the, how they eventually got their air, air conditioning because it was the better financial <laughs> deal. Um, yeah, what what did you lo- stick, what, what stuck out to you oh, from the interview? So much of it. Um, one of the things that really stood out for me was, and I think uh, maybe a lot of listeners who maybe haven't read his book, um, just maybe the differences between the Netflix show and his book. Because um, as I talked about in the interview, um, I was familiar with his work before the show came out. And I was like, well, why is this guy named Holden Ford and not and not John Douglas. And, you know, obviously he chatted about that. Uh, some of the differences between the book and the show, which of course, you know, there's always the Hollywood yeah. version of, of things, but, um, you know, just, he's obviously is a legendary uh, FBI agent and it was just, you know, a real honor to get to chat with him. Yeah, and one of the books that he mentioned um, of, of his, Law and Disorder, Disorder. Mm. I would, did want to mention it is available at EPL, along with a number of his other books, including his most recent one, The Killer Across the Table. So we will have um, a list of all of his books, as well as everything else that we kind of referenced during the interview in our show notes. Yeah. So at the beginning of our episode, we teased that we're going to run a contest for our Overdue Finds list listeners, where you can win a pair of tickets to what will surely be the sold out John Douglas event here in Edmonton on October the 28th. Caroline, yes. how, can our, how can our awesome listeners get a free pair of tickets? I'm so excited that we can do this. There are two ways of entering. So the first way, leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts between now and October 21st, and you'll be entered. Simply share what you like best about the show in your review. Yeah, we always tease, well, we always try and get people to, of course, leave a five-star mm-hmm. review. So obviously, if you really, especially if you liked this episode or there's been other episodes that you've really enjoyed, we'd really appreciate that, really appreciate that written review on Apple Podcasts because it really does help um, other people discover the show. And we definitely want to spread words about uh, what we're doing here at EPL. Mm-hmm. Um And of course, we also know that not everyone listens on Apple Podcasts. So for those of you who don't, uh, what you can do is you can head to Twitter or Facebook and let us know your own personal overdue find Mm -hmm. by using the hashtag EPL overdue finds. And don't forget, especially if you're on Twitter, uh, tag at EPL.ca in your message. So yeah, just let us know. Maybe there's a, a book you've recently enjoyed, a movie, TV show, anything at all, just like typically what we do at the beginning of each episode. And uh, let us know what your overdue find is, and we'll also enter you to win a pair of tickets. Yeah, if you've been listening and uh, you've been talking back to the podcast and saying, <laughs> I wish I could be gone there, because here's what I would share with Bryce and Caroline, this is your chance. Yeah, so of course, the contest closes on October 21st, which is 
a week before his event with us and uh, tickets are going to go quick. So please uh, enter the contest and we'd love to see you at the event. So our next episode will be available on Friday, October 11th. Bryce, can you share what we will be talking about? We are totally switching gears in our next <laughs> episode here. Uh, because we're going to be chatting about some of the work that EPL is doing with the Grey Nuns Hospital through our Welcome Baby program. And of course, if you're not familiar with the Welcome Baby program, uh, it promotes early literacy. So joining us to talk about this important program will be Dr. Amber Reichert and former guests from our Picture Books episode, which was very popular, by the way, Tamsin Shoot. So uh, Tamsin works uh, with Dr. Reichert. Obviously, they'll be on to ch chat about this very important Welcome Baby program that, of course, uh, promotes early literacy. Yeah, it's really exciting. And it'll, it's a great example of how EPL is helping to bring services and reduce barriers to service and really help out um, people access resources to help children, especially um, the young and vulnerable infants. So I'm really looking forward to being able to talk with them about that. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. We had a great time talking with John Douglas. Huge thank you to him for being so generous with his time today. Uh, when we were going through, uh, I, I, we have our list of questions. Yeah. And as, as we the interview went on for longer and longer, I kept kind of in my head going like, maybe we should cut maybe we'll have to reduce but then we just kept we just kept asking and he just kept answering yeah, so it was, it was incredible and i really think everybody's i really hope you enjoyed this episode today. yeah so thank you to him for talking about his legendary career in the fbi with us so tickets for his presentation in edmonton which is called the mind hunter's journey are now available on eventbrite and tickets start at just ten dollars yeah you can also uh, learn a little bit more about it by visiting epl.ca slash speaker series. And I should mention too, um, if the $10 tickets are sold out by the time you hear this, we do have some preferred seats available. Uh, those tickets are $125. They do come with a charitable tax receipt. And you also get to attend a post-event reception and meet Mr. John Douglas. So maybe you could get one of those uh, awesome bookmarks that he talked about. <laughs> yeah, those it. sound pretty fancy. I, I'm really excited to hopefully get one. <laughs> Fingers crossed. So a big thank you once again to MTech Digital for helping us out with today's recording and letting us use their amazing studio. You can learn more about their services at mtechdigital.ca. So that's M-T-E-K digital.ca. If you haven't yet, Please also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, because of course you can win tickets to John Douglas. And don't forget to tell a friend about the show. Of course, we'll have a link to everything that we talked about in today's show notes. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.